I, I don't know if I, um, uh, a lot of times I think what I want to speak about is really depressing and, and sad. <laughs> uh, and not necessarily because I'm a sad and depressed person, but, uh, you know, uh, our church, our movement was born where? It was born in a prison, you know. And I, I have become obsessed with, uh, fa not obsessed, uh, with Father's uh, time in Huna. I, I think that's, it's such a, it's a wonderful vehicle to understand um, uh, God's character and to understand um, what the meaning of our faith is, you know. And it's, uh, and I'm so glad you guys played uh, Battle Hymn of the Republic. Uh, I, first of all, I love that song, and there's a version of it on YouTube that's played by the um, the, the army army band. And if you want to cry, listen to that <laughs> because the part that I think is the third verse when it talks about uh, the version, they kind of slow down and they talk about the, the the white lilies in the field and Christ was was born across the sea. They really slow it down. And and then um, they and then that last line, let us let us fight to make men free. Is that what that line? Let us fight to make men. They they slow way down uh, with, with a with a glory in his bosom. Uh, he what to make men free? He transfigures, he transfigures us to make us. Transfigures you and me. Let us die to make men holy. Let us die to make men free. Let us die. Let us in that last line, this band they that let us. Die to make men free. You know, it's uh, it's ridiculously uh, inspiring. And that was like that became like the battle cry in the Civil War. You know, and it was really uh, it's it, it, that's when it became very popularized. And 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 Jackson, um, who's in the Navy, um, there's another version of this by a paratrooper in World War II, and it's all it's instead of glory, glory, it's gory, gory. Because they, 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 when they um, parachuted into uh, Normandy, into France, a lot of these guys, the parachutes didn't open, and they just slammed into the ground. And, and it's his experience. This old man. There's a video. Jackson showed me the video of it, where he's he made his own lyrics for the paratroopers. Means uh, the 92nd Airborne, right? And it's just uh, and it's and I said, Jackson, you know where this song actually comes from? And so I played him the army version of that, and I don't think he really wasn't too inspired by it, but I loved it, and that he had some connection to it through this old paratrooper, I guess, who died just recently. That's why he was showing it to us at dinner time, right? And it was, um, and I remember that, I just love that word transfigured, the transfigured you and me, and, and it's, uh, I feel, gosh, it's such a, it's a wonderful word, transfigured. And uh, transfigured. I've been transfigured by Jeannie. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I, I'm not crying. You're crying. You're crying. I'm not crying. You need You're tissues? crying. Tissues, Jack? No, 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 no. no. Um, and it was our anniversary. You're crying. I'm not crying. <laughs> Anyways, it's a uh, wonderful. I've been transfigured. It's true. Transfigured completely. I'm not crying. You're crying. <laughs> You're crying. Not me. I don't cry in front of people. It's, it's ridiculous. And um, it was our anniversary and um, Sam left for Navy boot camp um, a couple weeks ago. And I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> and, um, and it's so unexpected for Sam to do this, you know, because two years ago, first of all, he takes after Ching. He's literally 5'4 and 120 some pounds. Um, and uh, he, um, he is going, uh, anyway, he left for Navy boot camp. And, 
And so we dropped him off at the hotel here in Raleigh, and, uh, and a bunch of new, new recruits were flying an airplane to Great Lakes, Illinois, which is just north of Chicago. Um, like 30 minutes just north of Chicago, so he's there now. And as soon as they get there to the, the, um, the uh, to boot camp, uh, they call you and they read off this card that says, I have now arrived at R RDC uh, Great Lakes, um, you know, da, 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 da. and I figured he would call this like around dinner or something. <laughs> but no, he called, first of all, he tried to call Jackson, because uh, Jackson was home, and I think because he didn't want to wake me up. Uh, but Jackson didn't answer, of course, because he's asleep. But, you know, I woke up right away. He calls, and, and, he, and he says, Papa? I, at first I go, hello? I know it's Sam. I was expecting. He goes, Papa? I go, yes. And then he's, he's reading off a card. And you can hear in the background yelling and screaming and all that. And, and so he reads off the card. And uh, anyway, it's just to let parents and concerned people, spouses or whatever, to know that we've arrived safely. And uh, so he arrived safely, of course. And But it's so... What he, um, what his rate is going to be means his job is um, SWIC, <laughs> which nobody knows what that. Should I? Should I? Uh, we're a small group here, so maybe my long version will be I'll be done by uh, twelve, so thirty-five minutes. The short version I can be done shorter. Can I show you some video of Sam? Not Sam, but what Sam? Can you get YouTube up? Is that possible? If not, it's fine. It's no big deal. Anyway, SWIC. Country SWIC. S W C C. S W C C. S W C C. And uh, you don't have to turn off the lights. It's not that important. Um, but I, I, I just want to show this. Just cause, first of all, I'm so happy for him. You know, I, I can't get over it um, because two years, like I said, he's yay big, and. Um, and he was all, he's like one of these nerdy kind of anime kids, you know, who's kind of into computers and all that. And about a year and a half ago, he got into working out. And so for the past year and a half, all he did, like legitimately, was he's working out and getting strong, right? And, and earlier this year, you know, I, I always told him, you know, you, you can do um, some kind of that, that second uh, gen thing, um, What's it called? GPS. G G G G G GPF. G GPA. GPA or, and he was, she said, yeah, I, 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 you know, I said, they, they do wonderful missionary work, da, da, da. you can learn a little more about our faith. There's, it's all second gen kids, it's cool. And he was open to it, and I, it, but he was, um, do you have it, no? It, it's gonna come up. Is it? I, I know if not, it, it's fine, it's no big deal. Uh, and, and, um, <laughs> and, uh, so he was like this kind of kid, right? And then he was into, Swick would be, um... This one? Yes. Yeah, so. so, an extremely lethal. Special warfare combat crewmen are our nation's elite maritime mobility operators. But to join their ranks, it takes a special breed of warrior. For 37 weeks, Swick candidates are pushed to their absolute limits, both physically and mentally to ensure only those with a special mix of character, cognitive, and leadership attributes make the cut. We take you inside the SWIFT assessment and selection process, and the subsequent training will show you what it takes to become a part of the Solutia, small boat units in the Welcome to SWIFT, making an operator. Oh, this making an operator. Hold on just a second. Anyway, uh, that's enough. So that's it. Um, it's, it's, it's a special boat teams. And uh, their mission is uh, insertion and extraction of special forces. And they would see Active Valor here in the movie Active Valor. Anyway, they're, they're the boat guys. And they, after boot camp, he will go to Coronado, uh, California. And, um, and anyway, that's where the SEALs do their thing. So he's right there in Coronado. And it's not a guarantee that he'll make it. It's like an 80% fail rate. So, uh, uh, I'm not one to ask people to pray for anything, but if you can just keep Sam in your prayers, that would be very kind. Because uh, he's in boot camp now, and that's 10 weeks, so he graduates that at the end of October. And then he goes to Coronado, California to do this training um, in December. Um, and that's uh, literally like six, eight months to get to get through that. And I hope he makes it for his sake. That Jamie's okay if he doesn't make it, because. 
uh, it's kind of direct action stuff, you know, and, and I'm not saying I lied or Sam lied, but we just withheld <laughs> the facts. Because she was very concerned, like, do not, I do not want you, you know, in, in direct action things. But and Sam said, no, no, it's we're on the boats. Okay, you're on the boats, so it's mine. But it, Right, right. It's exactly. So when Mama saw this, she was like, she looked at, at it. What? I thought. So. Uh, it's not a seal. It's uh, it's um, seal support. Seal support. So it's it's uh, they're they call themselves the Ubers, <laughs> the Uber drivers for the seals and other special forces. To in. in so, but it's so unexpected. You know, he was a, a nerdy kid, and uh, yeah, to do this is, I, I still can't believe it. You know, you, you, you think things are gonna go a certain way, and they don't, you know, and, 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 and you never know what these kids are gonna do. Um, so, I believe, what was the title? I, how, how to deal with the impossible? How to deal with the impossible, or is this a, a catch, a, a, or what is the answer to a catch-22? What's the actual definition for a catch-22? Does anybody know? Does anybody have a phone? Look up the phone. What, like the definition of a, a catch-22. Um, or what's another damned explanation? If you, damned if you don't. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. So even if you do something, you lose, and if you don't do it, you lose. It's kind of like a no-win situation, a catch-22. I don't exactly even know where that phraseology came from. Novel. Hmm? Keller's novel, novel catch-22. Keller's, yes, the catch novel, catch-22. Yeah. That I should have military action. What is an example of catch-22? You can't get a job without experience, but you can't get experience unless you have a job. <laughs> like, like a kid, that, yeah, yeah, something like that, right? A little bit, yeah. yeah. And the reason why I was thinking of that because before um, Sam and Jackson, Jackson uh, left to go back to school, and before the boys were going back, we were looking for something to watch together as a family, like you know, in the old days. And so we kind of found the Mission Impossible movies, right? Because there's six, seven of them, right? Has, have you guys seen most of them, the Mission Impossible movies? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, they're wonderful, and uh, <laughs> they're great um, watching them because, especially the last few, uh, Ethan Hunt means um, Tom Cruise's character, his, he's part of this government agency, the IMF, the Impossible Mission Force. So they are giving these impossible missions. You damn if you do, you, you can't win, right? And um, the whole thing is, Tom Cruise, uh, Ethan, the main, main character, he's unwilling, especially the last few movies, he's unwilling to let other people sacrifice their lives, you know? And he's always put in the situation where the villain puts him in a place where even if you turn left, you turn right, you lose somebody that is close to you, right? And, and it's, it's heartbreaking to watch. And Tom Cruise, you know, he's always, the whole movie, and it's a running joke now that Tom Cruise is always running, you know, it's, and, it, and he, and um, it's, he, and eventually his character is really a messianic character uh, where um, it's, he's not willing to sacrifice his friends. He's, he's going to be the ultimate sacrifice and, and uh, he's put in these situations and he doesn't know how he's going to do it, but yet he keeps going forward and his, big, and his big thing that he always says, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Go to the next step and figure it out. And then go to the ne next step and figure it out. And, uh, and then uh, Jackson and Jamie and I went to the theater and saw the, the most recent one. And it's, it's, uh, it's amazing, actually. And to see how you react in the, when you're in a position of where you can't win. And I thought, God, you know, what if... And it, it, I thought of the situation where, uh, you know, Father... Uh, where father, you know, is always put in these situations, where, right, where you cannot win. And what did father do? And the answer to the, the my 
title, like how do you handle a no-win situation? You think it's gonna be something practical. Well, this is how you handle a situation. You won't like the answer. <laughs> You're not gonna like it. It's, it, uh, it's, you get, you work your ass off, is what it is. You, you work, and you forget about yourself. And it's not about you, and then, then it's about the other, and and in a no-win situation. And a great example. There's a ton of examples. This morning in the shop, I'm thinking, what am I? One of the examples, and this is, is um, I looked this up a, a couple years ago when um, H2 came. This is when he was in his Buddhist phase, right? He came to Father and said, Father, and, he, and this is a, like a typical Buddhist situation thing with the tiger. You know, uh, some dude has. Um, he's escaping something, right? And then he gets to a cliff and he climbs down the vine and then he's in on the cliff and there's a, a, a lion up there and then as he's escaping, oh, there's two tigers down there. And so he's caught between a rock and a hard place. He cannot get out. You are going to die in this situation. And everyone knows. It became a famous story, right? Everyone knows what, happened, what this... Something about a strawberry. Though. The strawberry. So he's on this vine, and then in the middle of this uh, of this cliff, there's a strawberry plant. All right, and the guy picks a strawberry, and so uh, H2 is trying to give Father this conundrum, like, what would you do, you know? And, and the point of the Buddhist thing is, well, uh, he's going to die, so he just eats the strawberry himself. And the and I looked this up and watched YouTube videos, uh, tons of videos about it. And the point of for this Buddhist or uh, thing is. Because um, you, you eat the strawberry and it tastes so delicious. And that means you're supposed to, you know, uh, live in the moment. Not look in the future, not look in the past, but just enjoy the. Enjoy the and of course, Father said, we, and H2 said uh, in, his, in that book, uh, without hesitation, without even skipping a beat, Father said, oh, you give the strawberry to the tiger. <laughs> you give it to the tiger. Uh, it, 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 without hesitation means you don't care about yourself. Oh, just give it to the tiger. And it's not like you give it to the tiger, then, well, the tiger thinks, well, he's a nice guy. I guess I'll let him down. No, Father, Father, just, you just give it to the tiger. You know, without any ulterior motive whatsoever. You know, and, uh, and there's that one. And many times in, in, uh, in Hungnam, He's put in ridiculous no-win situations. And this is a testimony from Wan Pil Kim. Um, and it's, uh, I'll just, it's just a couple pages, and it's short. And uh, Wan Pil Kim uh, testified this in July 1983, and it's titled Mother's Love. Father came from a very large family. His mother had many responsibilities, taking care of their meals and handling many family affairs. But father's mother loved him so much for her beloved son, she prepared food and carried it to Hongnam to give to him. When father was a student in Japan, he sent a telegram to his mother. This, so father's in Japan. Uh, he sent a telegram to his mother informing her of the day he would return home for a visit. World War II was going on, and the boat on which father had planned to arrive was attacked and sunk. When father's mother heard about the sinking of the boat, she searched the list of list of passengers. Although she did not find the name of her son, she thought he must have died along with the others. She felt so bad that she could not stay at home, so she went alone from their village in North Korea to Busan, which is, Busan's very south, right, so it's far away, to find out about her son. Arriving at the harbor, she could not find any news of her son and turned around to go home. On her way home, she felt so much anguish she cried all the time and almost went crazy with grief. She did not even realize where she was walking or when her shoes wore out. Barefoot, she walked over stones and thorns. Her feet were bleeding, but she was not even aware of the pain because she was thinking only of her son. When father was about to board that boat that sank, something had occurred. His body remained fixed. He could not move his feet. So he sensed that something would happen to him if he were to take that boat. Therefore, he stayed in Japan. And a lot of these details in Father's life, they sound made up, right? Like, like Father's body froze. 
Really? I, I believe that, actually. When I was living in Chicago, right before I joined, I became paralyzed. Did I tell you this, Jamie? About my legs not working? I was in my apartment and my legs stopped functioning. And I, around my apartment, and I, I'm a 19 year old kid. Am I 18? 18, maybe 19. And I'm going around my apartment just on my hands, kind of getting around. And I thought no big deal of it because it actually happened once before in my hometown when I was like, my, my legs stopped working. And I had, and at the time I didn't feel like, I, oh, my legs stopped working. All right, well, they'll, they'll come back. Like, if it was to happen now, I'd be like, what the? You know, you'd go nuts. But when you're young, you know, things happen. And so I, I absolutely believe that his body stopped functioning. Because mine did. And then that, that because I, I was planning on doing something that day, so my plans had been delayed. And then later that day or the next day is when I got witness. So I figured, well, God made my leg stop working, right? Paralyzed me. Yeah, you know, it happens. Um, During his student, uh, so therefore, when his body froze, he sensed that something would happen, and therefore he stayed in Japan. During his student days in Japan, father was arrested by the police, and his mother was so sad when she heard the news that he was jailed and he was subjected to torture. Then, when she heard he was imprisoned in Hunan, she again felt grieved. When she came to visit her son in Hunan and saw him in a very miserable condition with almost no hair and clad in shabby prison coat, she cried and cried. But father was very strict with her. If you are going to cry for me, please don't visit me again. Father didn't want to see her crying for him. He wanted to see her cry for God. This gives us an insight into how father feels about the relationship between human love and divine love. Father always puts priority on God's love. I think that distinction is really important. Uh, uh, human love and divine love. And I, I, many people have criticized Father about a lot of stuff. And I'm thinking, uh, one example, some, some, I, I don't know if I said this before, somebody said, well, Father's not something, something because, uh, you know, he said that Gerald Bush, or George, not Gerald Bush, uh, Ford, Gerald Ford would win the presidency and he didn't. So, you know what, Father doesn't know everything. I'm thinking, really, that's your line? Is that Father said Gerald Ford would be and didn't? I'm thinking, well, Father has two. Father has, he, Father is God, but He's not God. Father has a divine nature. Father has a human nature. They're, they're, these are very important distinctions to make. And they, Juan Pil Kim made it right here. If Father feels the relationship between uh, feels about the relationship between human love and divine love, and Father always puts priority on God's love. That's why Father is so difficult <laughs> uh, with everything, because it's not about human feelings or emotions. It's truly about God's and, and God only. Father was very concerned about the motiv motivation be behind his mother's tears, whether they were for God or for himself. If she had been crying for him as God's son, as one who is doing God's will, Father would have been happy to see her crying. But she was crying because she saw her son in a miserable situation. Because of their strong mother-son bond, it was hard for father to look at his mother crying. He knew, of course, how difficult it had been for her to make the trip to Hunan. She had prepared everything for him and traveled a long way just to see him. But still, he had to tell her this. When mothers prepare food for their children, they really want their children to have it. But father shared his food, uh, shared the food his mother had brought with the other prisoners. And he says here, right in front of their eyes, this act really hurt his mother's heart. Can you imagine that? <laughs> like, you, like, I can't do that. Like, when my mother comes to visit, we don't even pray before dinner because I think it might offend her. So I don't even, we, we just go, that's mas, okay, da, 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 da because I don't want to offend my mother. 
How weak am I? This dude right here, she, he knows how much she's tr suffered to come to home now, making this food. He receives it, turns it right around, here you go. <laughs> That's a badass right there, man. That is somebody who's truly good. I, can, I, can you imagine? You, you know you're going to destroy your mother's heart, but yet you do it. Oh, I couldn't do that. That's why it, I'll continue, but I just remember. I know Reverend Young, was, his point was like a fourth Adam. Everyone's a fourth Adam. Be a fourth Adam. And people love to express, I am true. You know, I will be true parent. Are you sure? Yeah, right. Are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> do you know what that means? What is the history of Adams? <laughs> it ain't a good one. <laughs> Hard pass, man. I will pass on that. No, no thanks. I, I... I know the history of all the Adams, and it doesn't end well for them, really. You know, it, praise the Lord that, you know, someone is willing to do that. But that someone ain't me. I, I, I'm not. It takes a lot. I can't do that. I can't. I can't even pray <laughs> before dinner for, in front of my mom because I'm like, oh, you know, she's not really making her feel uncomfortable. That, um, that it's not in my composition. I, I'm not going to be a fourth Adam. I am not going to be two parents. <laughs> no. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> and with Mom Tokyo's Teresa, I really suffer when I see and hear about my son. This is father's mother speaking. Uh, because of other people, she told me. It means she's telling this to Mom Tokyo Kim. Even though he's innocent, he's suffering so much, being thrown in prison. Next time, I want to protect him. She asked me, Juan Po Kim, to tell father the next time I see him that she wanted to protect him in the future. So tell him, tell him, tell him, I will protect him. She wanted to stay behind him in order to keep him from danger. She cried all the way back home. And since she cried all the way back home, I, she says, I won't visit my son again. She declared a, a, upon her return. Her feelings had been hurt so deeply, I assume from father giving this food away, um, that she had made with so much heart and sincerity, her son had shared with the other prisoners. But even as she had said that, Juan Kim said, she began preparing for her next visit. <laughs> like, unstoppable. Unstoppable. So yeah, the difference... But that little section, the difference between divine and human love, I think it's, it's really important distinction. Like when we say God is love, many, we are living in 21st century, I say this a lot, we, we don't know, we, for us, love is always yes. Yes. You're great. You're wonderful. No, you're not. <laughs> no, sorry. No, we're not great. You know, there's a difference between, uh, if God is willing to let Christ and true parents suffer like this, what is he going to allow you to do? How much is he going to allow you to suffer for crying out? If he's willing that, to do that to his own direct lineage, you know. <laughs> but <clears throat> the ultimate, at least in Hong Nam, and I realize uh, with the whole, what do you do in an impossible situation and that we wouldn't like the answer? Father, everyone knows the story, right? Father, um, maybe not. Uh, Father, at the once a year, the prisoners are supposed to, to write some reflection about how great Kim Il Sung is, right? And Father's thinking, I can't do that. I will not do that. But if you don't write this reflection, you're killed. You have to write how great Kim Il Sung is. If you don't, you're dead. But we'll we'll make you work even harder, or just shoot you. You're dead. And Father refuses. I refuse to do it. He goes, I, I can't do it. So, did you, do you guys know what his solution is? I forgot. <laughs> I worked so hard that they couldn't kill me. That I took upon... I worked and worked and fulfilled the quota of those stupid fertilizer bags... Every day, so that the warden of the prison 
said, oh, he's a good worker, let's not kill him. That's how we got out of it. I die or I have to write it. What am I going to do? There's a third choice. I'm going to make myself so indispensable that he cannot kill me. And that's next level stuff. And my, I actually really, after I told Bob the title of this, I thought, you know, this is ridiculous. Who really has life and death situations in their lives? Does, does anybody have like a no-win situation? You do. Recently? No. No? I mean, I bet, I, I'm sure we all have something, but um, yeah. I, I just thought those two stories, what do you do in the situation? So Father refused to praise Kim Il Sung. Does anybody get Godable? Yeah. yeah. The, two weeks ago, this one Godable came out, and I hadn't heard this. And it, 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 it made me very sad. <laughs> very sad. <laughs> um, it's all about Father going back to North Korea. And first of all, Father went to North Korea. <laughs> After all that in Hongnam, he eventually ended up back where he started in, in, in North Korea in 1991. That blows my mind. I, can't, I still can't believe it. Anyway, uh, so this is oh, my glasses. I don't have my glasses. Do I have my glasses? Oh, no. Does anybody have reading glasses? No. That's okay. I can read this. Um, let's see if these are the first Are you okay? You're walking for me. That is better. That is okay. All right. Dialogue with Kim Il sung. Father visits his birthplace. After receiving an official invitation from the North Korean government, true parents arrived in North Korea on November 30th, 1991. This was true father's first visit to North Korea after an absence of 40 years and 11 months. He met his surviving relatives at his hometown of Chongju on December 5th. So he'd been in North Korea for about a week. Father said that his birthplace will be a holy ground to which people of the world will make pilgrimages. His visit to North Korea greatly interested both local and foreign mass media and at the farewell ceremony held at a guest house in Sangjongol, Pyongyang on December 6th, so the next day. Father emphasized that true love is a driving force behind unification. And he explained that love is thicker than blood. Kind of play on the word, right? Usually we say what? Blood is thicker than blood, water. Blood is thicker than water. I still don't know what that means. Um, we flew to my hometown in North Korea in two helicopters. The 70 mile trip took only 40 minutes. We landed in a schoolyard and drove to my old house. The road was paved so nicely that cars could travel on it. I was told that, they, that it took them 10 days to pave the road for my visit. The level of preparation they made for me was on par with the level they would have made for Kim Il-sung. They took meticulous care to put out much effort in covering my parents' graves with good sod and placing gravestones with words carved in red. When we went to the house where I once lived, I discovered that they had also repainted it entirely, the entirety of the house, probably upon orders from Kim Il-sung. The interior had an earthen floor, as do most traditional Korean houses, buttressed with rocks and stacked strongly around it, finished up with cement. <coughs> the yard was covered with sand. They had done a wonderful job. They were like Esau, trying to serve his younger brother, Jacob, as king. I asked Kim Il-sung to open up my hometown so that Chongju will become, will, can welcome people from around the world to visit and participate in workshops. This is the heart for which I visited Kim Il-sung. No amount of opposition could suppress this. No amount of opposition could suppress this. The heart which I, so that's his heart towards Kim Il-sung. No amount of Opposition could suppress this. I'm not sure what that means. When heaven casts its net of righteousness, it catches everything that is not in accordance with the heavenly principle. That is why they placed gravestones on my parents' graves and covered them with good sod. 
It was none other than, than Kim Il-sung himself who ordered that this be done. He told his people to pave the two-lane road leading to my hometown, and they even paved an asphalt road to my parents' graves. His hospitality was greater than that of Esau when he welcomed Jacob. Why is, why is the Esau of Korea greater than the Esau of Israel? It was because the Israelites were the first chosen people, the formation stage, the beginning. Christianity was the second Israel at the growth stage. However, America never dreamed of developing my hometown as a holy ground. Because Kim Il-sung did this, North Korea possesses the authority as people of the third Israel. How miserable to be in North Korea. <coughs> During my meeting with Kim Il-sung, he asked me, Reverend Moon, you went to your birthplace, right? When I answered yes, and thanked him for it, he told me, that place will one day be a famous site. I'll take care of everything. When he said that, the people next to him, you can just see these dumb generals with their stupid little, hey, hey, you know, I, I, I can't. I can't even. Um, yes, we understand, Mr. President. The words of Kim Il-sung carry a lot of weight, as weighty as the words of God. I added a rider to his promise, though. He said, let me add something else. <clears throat> I told him to turn it my home, turn the hometown that I used to live in when I was a boy. I added, I told him to turn it into the hometown that I used to live as when I was a boy. It means take it back to how it originally was. I gave them directions as what to put and where and how to make it in such a way. If they do this, it will become a pilgrimage site for Unification Church members across the world who will vividly see and feel the things of the past that I've talked about. The next one is actually what I really want to get to. Because going from Hung Nam and then, what, 40, over 40 years later, do, doing what he, he does is incredible. I only f know it's incredible because, I, again, I couldn't do it. I'm, I am full of, I can't say hate, I'm not full of hate, but I'm full of, like, vengeance. In one sense, violence. I'm full of violence. And I'm fine with violence, actually. Uh, you know, unfortunately. But Father is not. <laughs> and he has every right to be, after what has happened in his life. And how he explains this. Listen to this. When I was visiting, when I visited North Korea, my family and even distant relatives came to greet me. I did not say a word. They wanted to greet me and hold me, and I did not want to let me go. They didn't want to let me go. But I kept silent, didn't say a word, because I knew how the communist world works. Why would I not say how thrilled I was to see my older and younger sisters again? It is because every, so uh, this is actually another no-win situation. And the list of fathers takes care of this. It is because everything I said would have been have, would have to be reported to the superior authorities. If the words of my younger sister and the words of my older sister were different, they would both be in trouble. But how could they give the exact same report? So Father's thinking, how can how can I allow them to survive and give the exact same report? <clears throat> Does anybody have any idea? I. My nephews and everyone who was present had to give a report. Should any of their reports be different from the others, they would find themselves in serious trouble. They would be accused of lying. And as a result, I would be banned from North Korea. And then, not only would I be banned, but then they would lose their lives if, all, if their reports were different. In North Korea, the entire family must report. Husbands, wives, everyone from kindergarten to grandparents report to different offices. Having said that, if people in the same family write identical reports, that also poses a problem. So we say, even if they report the same thing, that's a problem. If they report different, it's a problem. If they report the same, that's a why is it, if they report the same, that's a problem. Because the father says, they could be accused of collaborating <laughs> on the reports and be bound hand and foot. Theirs is a world where you cannot speak freely, even though you have a mouth and where and where a slip of the tongue can spell trouble. So what does Father do? 
It's a no-win situation. They die or they don't. They, they die or they, you know, they, they die. Yeah, exactly. That's the other one, they die. I lost my hometown. I lost, I lost all there was in North Korea. Even though I know that my father and mother met a tragic end, I have to love Kim Il-sung. Thanking him for protecting my parents. Can you imagine? He said, thank you. I'm not oblivious to how their lives ended, how miserable it was. Standing in front of my mother's grave, do you not think I would weep bitterly? Though bearing inexpressible grief, inexpressible grief. He knows how he treated his mother previously. He knows, clearly. And he's there now. When he was, how old was he when he was there? In his late 60s, early 70s. Though bearing inexpressible grief, I was in pain, using all my energy, using all my energy to keep myself from bursting into tears because I did not want my enemies to see me wailing. I still remember I had to bite my tongue and fight back tears because I did not want people to report that Reverend Moon came to North Korea just to visit the graves of his mother and father until all the problems are resolved naturally. I will devote myself to the reunification of Korea. My older, my older and younger sisters completely broke down in tears when I went to my parents' graves in North Korea. Father, mother, the son you've been waiting for so long has finally returned. Here he is. Father's walking up to you. Here he is. He's here. He came back to you. Anyone who was there listening to their cries amid such tragedy could not help but weep too. However, this is, this is the divine love. I did not go there to be a son with my family name of Moon, but rather as a leader who came to bring about the unification of Korea. Look at the countless graves. There are many who have died unimaginably tragic deaths. So I could not shed tears just for my own suffering parents. As I saw my sisters burst out crying, I prayed, honored father and mother, he's speaking to his parents, Honored father and mother, I'm sorry, I cannot cry, because I came here as a public person. When I came here, after, when I come here, after unifying North and South Korea, I will fulfill my duty as a filial son, and can take responsibility for your graves. I will attend you after I build a unified kingdom where I can attend God and convey his blessing to all people. You know, I mean, I just started crying at the beginning of this when I'm talking about my wife. <laughs> How can you thank the man who literally killed your parents? You know, and who did to him what had happened to him in Hong Kong? I would be full of revenge. Sorry to say, I can't do that. But yet he comes back like this. And we all, we, we've seen the pictures with, with him around, you know, holding hands with Kim Il-sung, you know. I, I don't, I still don't, I can't understand the level of, of how much he loves God more than anything else, you know, to do that. It, it's, it's, um, I don't have that in my character. My mother was truly pitiful. Out of the 13 children she bore, five passed away, and she raised eight of us. Among her children, she loved me the most. She would do anything for me, but I was never able to buy her a pair of socks or even a handkerchief. She did not perform any noteworthy deeds in her lifetime. She did nothing. But at the end of the providence of restoration, I will make known how much merit she deserves because of the way she lived for me. That is why, even though it is truly heartbreaking, I continue this work until that day comes. I can still remember how she cried at the top of her lungs, shedding a waterfall of tears, her nose running because she felt terrible about something I had done. As I stood in front of my honored parents' graves in North Korea, I felt I was truly an undutiful son. From a secular, human viewpoint, I would be considered unfilial, 
a bad son. You see, feelings. I'm a bad son. This part, I'm just going to read one more paragraph. All of you want to go to my hometown. I told Benji about this, about, about this one. A couple weeks ago at the, at the, at the park. The, the, about what I'm going to read. All of you here want to go to my hometown. I was very disappointed when I visited there in 1991. The trees in the mountains 50 years ago, there were, 50 years ago, before this, there were trees in all the mountains. And I used to be able to hear the howling of wolves, but there's not even one tree left. I was stricken to look at the barren scenery. Which is true. When there was a video uh, a long time, age two, when he went to North Korea and he visited the spot, and even when father was there, right? Like there's, it's barren, it's sand. And even the, in the background of that video, when he went to the father's hometown, you can see them, they're all barren. It looked really like desert, right? And it's, what father was saying, that's what he's lamenting. It's like desert. I was stricken to look at the barren scenery. I thought to myself, listen to this, I thought to myself, he's there praying in front of his parents' grave. Maybe it would have been better if I had not come at all. <laughs> Can you imagine? Looking at my town that has gone through such a change, my impressions of the past suddenly left me. In general, People can erase memories of the past when they have more beautiful environments in the present. But the fact is, because my images of the past were so more beautiful than the present, the more I tried to erase them, the more vividly those images came back. So when I, come, so when I go back to my hometown, I have a plan to gather the young Unification Church soldiers and elite troops from around the world and rebuild my hometown to its original state, the way I remember it. For when I read that a couple weeks ago, I thought, you know, I was, I thought, God, like I can't retire, I can't finish. <laughs> I told you this, right? I, I want to go to North Korea. I pray for the unification of South Korea because I want to go back to the Father's hometown and replant those trees. You know, <laughs> I'm not crying. You're crying. <laughs> you guys are crying. I'm not crying. I want to go back and plant those trees. Father, father had to, to emotionally what he went through right here, and I don't think I, I think I missed that part. So, what was his solution to everyone having the same report? I, I must have missed it. I didn't read it because he said nothing to anybody. He said he didn't speak, he didn't speak to them. So that when they had report, oh, he didn't say anything. <laughs> it's, that was the solution, not to say anything and not to cry. And then to completely heartbroken at what, what was once so beautiful is now so ugly, you know. And, and I, I don't want to end on something that's so depressing and sad. Um, because Bob's service yesterday, a week ago, he talked a lot about um, Father prophesized. What Father said before came true. And we don't think of Father as prophesizing and things coming true. We don't think of him that way. Christ, a lot of Christians say Christ, uh, the, what help, what, some of the evidence that helps prove he is the Christ because he prophesies. He's fulfilled prophecies. And why is that? What, what is prophets? Uh, it's Christ, Father, Jesus knew the law of identity, and so did Father. That's all it is. Prophecy is knowing the future because of what is of the law of identity. That's it. And um, so I don't want to end on something sad and depressing. I, and the only two weeks ago, you know, Father, it's really not two weeks ago. Father, of course, we're talking about the, the unification of North and South Korea. So two weeks ago, August 18th,
South Korea, Japan, and America, they all met in Camp David. Do you guys know Camp David? Camp David is right outside DC. It's in Maryland. It's this vacation spot for the president to get away. Camp David has hosted many diplomatic things. Uh, everyone here knows the history between South Korea and Japan. And the, the big sticking issue a lot was the Koreans still feeling hatred towards the Japanese about during the occupation, the soldiers using the, the Korean women as com comfort women. They call them comfort women, right? That's still a huge problem. But um, they're overcoming this. Uh, I, the White House put out this statement about, uh, and on the, New York, the, the Washington Times had a wonderful expose about the meeting of, of President of South Korea and the Minister of Japan and President Biden, and it, it's like, um, even though we see a lot of division, I think that one thing, and why are they coming, and they're, what it is, it's a trilateral agreement of self-protection and self-defense and of security, right? And it's all because of what North Korea is doing and what China is doing. But I, I felt that this, it was such a hopeful thing that South Korea, the president there has taken such a, a risk, political risk, because people don't, people still don't want to re uh, resolve the, the issue in Japan. Uh, so, but they made this security agreement with America. You know, I think that's so. It's you have the the Adam nation, the Eve nation, and the Archangel nation, right? The Elder Sun nation coming together and working together to fight evil, to fight communism. And it's, I, I think that's a, it's a great starting point, beginning, beginning point um, to resolve. So I can get to Father's hometown and start planting trees. <laughs> that's it. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, the pain and the suffering that, that has happened um, is, is in the past. Father, the future is bright. Father, proclaimed that the kingdom of heaven will be built. Father, Father's life and the things that he did proved and showed that what he said will come to pass. And Father emphasized and believed and showed us the example of the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, I have to believe. I have to trust Father. I have no choice. He's given me everything. Therefore, I have to believe the words that he said and to believe in the future of peace and of human unity. Father, every day we don't see a lot that can prove this, but in the huge, much larger province of restoration, I think there are signs of things that are, are truly moving forward and happening that will allow North and South Korea to unite, to become the beginning point of the kingdom of heaven. Father, I pray that through this, your heart, true parent's heart, can truly be healed and resolved and everything can be forgiven and ultimately everything, all the sadness, all the pain can be forgotten. Father, may we live according uh, to your will and your providence. May uh, you protect uh, all of us here and as we go forward uh, with this new week. And I offer this prayer in the name of the true parents. Adieu and amen. Sorry for going.